So we we have ten and a half hours of uh, memory capacity. If, if if you were to speak that long, <laughs> I have a meeting at thirty, so I'm going to say no. <laughs> I don't think that's that's very likely. But I just wanted to tell tell you we're prepared for anything you do, and for however long you're going to do it. So. That's that's great. I think other people have better things to do, so I'll be listening to you talk. Cool. Should I start? Is everyone? Yes. Okay, great. Um, hi, folks. I'm Patrick. Uh, you have many, many hats, so I'll put that one up there. I'm, I'm over in Department of Medicine, uh, but I'm also a fellow with AD, which is the Machine Intelligence Institute. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to, there is, maybe some of you saw there was a big sparkly announcement yesterday by the provincial government about support for artificial intelligence research in Alberta at early kickstart our diversification. And Amy's in the center of that, so I'm going to spend two or three slides after we get in telling you about the Machine Intelligence Institute, just so you know what kind of cool folks and cool research is being done, and then you can follow up later. Um, before I do that, the usual thing I ask is, what does everyone work on? What do you do? What do you research? What do you think about? What do you study? Um, is that okay? Just go around the room, maybe tell me a little bit about yourself. What are you studying? Uh, I'm studying biosci. Mm -hmm. And that's about it. Okay, that's what's your, What's your name? Manal. That, that helps too. That helps too. Manal. Yeah. Uh, I'm Rabbi and I'm also studying biosci. Biosci, cool. And Sandri, I'm currently in computer science studying networking and thinking about going into artificial intelligence, machine learning, all that. Cool, so undergrads, grad level, I, I never know. Okay. Undergrad, grad, grad? Undergrad. Undergrad? Yes. Grad? No, grad. Undergrad. No, they're, they're all. Up. Undergrad, yeah. So okay. it's a graduate course, but occasionally, like now, every single person in it is an undergrad. So they've all been interviewed by by me, which which means that if if you find them to have highly objectionable characteristics, your fault. I should have noticed it's your, that. It's your fault. It's so okay. <laughs> no. That's right. I should have detected this and kept them out. That was great. It means we can also show people really cool things early on to <laughs> change to, to, to career trajectories. This is fantastic. Please. Uh, my name is Anissa, and I'm in biochemistry. I'm Abrar. I'm an undergrad in my second year of physiology. Hi, I'm Pooja, and I'm a uh, research fellow on the doctoral theme. So. Oh, hi, I'm Amir. Um, I'm a first year uh, economics student. Oh, you're gonna take my you're gonna take my seat. Oh man! All right, fine. I'll move. I'll move back over here. Cool. Sorry. Uh, economics? Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Sorry, I was like I was ceding my my footrest to the new company. Hi, I'm Mirazan. I'm a Raynal fellow with Dr. Solis. Hi, my name's Gagan. I'm a third year chem student. Uh, my name's Chris. I'm a bachelor of commerce student. I'm Julie. I'm also in this I'm Simon. I'm in cell biology. Uh, I'm Kata. I'm in biochemistry. Oh, cool. Okay, wow. So we have a lot of we have a lot of bio something in the house, and also a lot of ching. What do you? What's the summary for things that relate to finance and economics? Anyway, all right. <laughs> Good to know. Um, chingology, I think, is how they say it. Okay. Cool. So I'm going to tell you about artificial intelligence medicine. If you think that's a good idea. If not, we can totally change gears. But um, this is the kind of I, I'm assuming Osmar's coming already and given yep, his lectures. three lectures. Okay. So Osmar's talked to you. Has Rich talked to you? Does everyone? Yeah. No. Okay. So you haven't heard from Rich. Uh, so maybe I'll branch out from what Osmar has told you. But maybe first tell me what Osmar told you, so I don't repeat things. In in uh, very general terms, <laughs> I, I'm just gonna say we can we can maintain the awkward silence for as long as it is reasonable. I'm, just, I'm really curious to also not get you speaking. Uh, it's also important. Machine learning, deep learning, artificial neural networks. Anyone else want to add? <laughs> Thank you, by the way, for jumping in. That's fantastic. Yeah, he gave us a brief overview of um, how machine learning works. Um, mm -hmm. He'd like to emphasize the fact that the machines don't actually understand anything that's going on. They can just do it very really well. Um, he also gave us a brief overview of the current technologies we have because of machine learning. So um, examples in high, well, very advanced surveillance technology, but also in the ability of computers to beat human professionals in medicine for identifying things like tumors. Yeah. And even like vision disorders as well. That's another really cool one that just popped out. Um, Real-time decision. I didn't talk at all about any of the, the recent game work, like yes. um, AlphaGo and things like that. Okay, awesome. So I'm not going to tell you any about, about any of that then. I'm going to try to do two things. Actually, I'll do a bunch of things. 
Uh, but my main, my main goals are going to be to help you think about AI in medicine, that's one thing. Um, and another is to actually zoom out and think from a bird's eye perspective about intelligence in general. This is something often we get, we get down in the details. Uh, I know Osmar is really good at, at spanning a different level of detail, but maybe I'll give you my perspective so you can disagree with me uh, readily and publicly. Uh, first, I did want to tell you a little bit about Amy. Uh, everyone maybe has seen or bumped into something about Amy, but if you haven't, it's uh, uh, our Machine Intelligence Institute. It's a, a provincial institute. It is now separate from the university, but very tightly coupled to the university because for almost two decades, we've been a world leader in artificial intelligence right here in Edmonton. Most people don't know that because we don't talk about it and we're really bad at doing our own PR. But Edmonton has been a, a hot spot for AI for uh, as long as, as AI is becoming, it's becoming trendy. So this is a really neat thing. We have access to some of the best thinkers in the world in machine intelligence right here in Edmonton. I'm actually going to show you a bunch of these people. Um, and many of them have been around for some time. Many of them you know. You can see folks like Osmar down at the bottom right there. So the pictures are so we. But we've got a diverse set of people that are studying all manner of different problems and technologies relating to intelligence. Uh, and now Amy is building out a build our capacity to interact with, with industry as well, both startups and, and larger industry. And as, as maybe Osmer told you a little bit about, this has been everything from the fundamentals of, of reinforcement learning, the algorithms for learning through trial and error, right through to like pros uh, being beaten in heads up no limit poker, Mike Bowling was working on that work, the game of checkers being solved, the origins of things like AlphaGo as you were just mentioning. Um, Everything from Randy, actually, Randy Gable, who was on the previous slide, uh, built a system that was capable of essentially passing the Japanese bar exam, like a law exam, and having the system be able to actually take that bar exam and pass, which is kind of kind of exciting. And the stuff that, that maybe I'll show you more of today, which is centering around adaptive rehabilitation technologies. And given this is a, a course, nominally speaking, located within the Faculty of Medicine and Dentistry, I feel this is a, a great topic for us to deep dive on. Um, and so with that, I'm actually really gonna gonna say it's less about artificial intelligence and medicine and being appointed in a physiatry division. Let's talk a little bit more about how AI supports thinking, moving, and perceiving. Is that okay? We usually like, zoom out a little bit and, and talk more about physiatry, but also more about about perception and action and how they link together. Okay, cool. Okay, then then if you all agreed to that, which I was hoping you would, or I'd have changed my slides. Uh, the idea that I'd like to get across today, one of them is just. Uh, what is AI? So hopefully by the end of this you'll all be able to go out to a party or go, go talk to someone over coffee and actually talk clearly about AI and machine learning. I know you're already primed for this because Osmar has given you a really good, really good background, but I want you to be able to, again, span the spectrum of, of very fine details right out to, to the broad picture. And in service I'm going to try to help, help you broaden your definitions and broaden your understanding by giving you some other defining characteristics that I think are present in, in AI and, and machine learning. Uh, specifically, I want you to be able to deep dive into how it's going to apply to medicine in a, in a few different ways and give you some resources so that you can follow up if you think these examples are super cool. I think the examples I'll show you are super cool. I'm mainly just going to show you videos. Uh, and so I, I want you to be able to follow up on those if you find them exciting or compelling or maybe something that motivates your own work. Uh, the last bit maybe, and this is sort of a meta point, is that I hope you're going to be able to think a little bit more, add to what you're already doing, to think on how changes in an intelligent system technology are going to change your lives in the next five to 10 years. Because I think we're going to see radical change in how we as people live our lives, and so it's great to start thinking about it early. Uh, the first examples, I'm going, to, I'm going to start, I'm going to give you a, a rapid fire series of cool examples. Who's seen this video before? Besides Kim, who like is sick of all of my videos by now, I'm sure. Um, okay, then this is, this is great, I'm glad that, that this seems new. This is someone named Jan Sherman, she's working with the teams down in the University of Pittsburgh on what's called the BrainGate Project. Uh, I think one important thing to note is that uh, Jan is paralyzed from the neck down. So she can't move her body below her neck. And what she's doing here is actually using her brain to control a robot arm to feed herself. So those, those little gray plugs, you can see there's like two little gray things on Jan's head. Those are direct plugs into the surface of Jan's brain. So there's electrode arrays that are mounted on the surface of her cortex. And just by thinking, Jan is able to uh, move this robotic arm to control this robot, project herself out into the world to feed herself chocolate bars, silly strings, you'll see her eating red pepper later, she fist bumps a doctor, drinks from a juice cup. Like, this is, I think, fairly miraculous, which why I wanted to bring this up first, is that this isn't the matrix, she doesn't, like, maybe know, well, I don't know if she knows kung fu, but she certainly didn't learn it from her brain implants. But what she is doing, like, these are literally technologies that are interacting directly with the surface of her brain and allowing her to control the bionic body part. It's a, it's a case of projecting herself out of her body uh, using her brain. Okay, this is one, one more main example. 
But I want to jump into another example of how we interact with brains because this is the last slide is typically when we, we talk about neurotechnology, when people will show demonstrations of neurotechnology, they'll show you something like that last video. I'm, again, I'm pleased you haven't seen it because it's new material. There's also the idea that in addition to just recording from the brain, that we may wish to record from the brain and put information back into the brain. Uh, so one example I think that's, that's quite salient, again coming from a residuary background, is a case where there might be tra traumatic brain injury. Imagine a part of the brain, the, the actual wet where our human biological tissue is damaged. And we see this all the time in workplace accidents, in neurodegeneration. There's parts of the brain or our central nervous system that are broken and can't be repaired. So work, work by many people across the globe, but I'm showing you right now some work by someone named Theodore Berger and his team, are looking at how one might actually replace whole modules of the brain to be able to say, you know, we, we had this piece of neural tissue. How does it work? Can we model it? Can we make a piece of technology, software and hardware, that would record from all the places that would have fed into this damaged piece of tissue and then give accurate outputs back into the rest of the brain? Uh, the, this specific example is looking at memory consolidation. If someone's lost the, the part of their brain that lets them turn long-term into short-term or short-term into long-term memory. Perhaps someday we might have a, a piece of technology that would take on the function of that lo that lost piece of brain tissue and allow someone to turn their recent experiences into into longer-term histories. So this is the kind of promise of, of the style of, of neurotechnology. Getting a little more removed from the central nervous system, I just want to show you this example. This is the gentleman with dual upper limb amputation, so someone who has amputations at the shoulder, and he's controlling two robotic arms using signals from his body. This is uh, signals that have been sent by his brain downstream and are recorded by this device from the, the skin, from the muscle tissue and the, and the peripheral tissue of, of his body. And so what's really nice here is that, that this is another example like that, that example with Jan Sherman in that first slide, where someone is using their, using their intent to control robotic devices and extend them into the world, they allow them to interact with the world around them and, and more fully live the, their daily life using their technology. Um, you can go see all these videos on, on YouTube if you want. Uh, even more intimately connected, I want to show you this example. This is something called osseointegration. So very recently, it's not just strapping prostheses onto the body. This gentleman here actually has the prosthetic arm is attached directly to the bone structure of his body. So his, his bone of his residual limb has been modified to have a, a metal socket that's implanted within the bone. He can take his prosthetic arm, clip lock it on, and now be able to uh, control mechanically and electrically this robotic arm. So instead of trying to like strap a prosthetic device onto the body as we have for really thousands of years, we're now seeing where prostheses that can be integrated directly into the bone structure. What's very cool is there's folks like Max Orts Catalan and folks up in Sweden and Australia that are looking at how you might not just do mechanical coupling, but one might run wires actually through this socket, come out from the bone inside the body and connect to muscles and nerves inside the body. So when you connect a limb onto the body, it may not just mechanically connect, but also electrically connect to the nervous system, to the muscle tissue of the body. This is really exciting. This is very, very new, and we're starting to see some very interesting deployments of like larger scale osseo integration. Question? No? Oh, sorry, I saw you raise your hand. I was like, no, feel free to ask, if you do, please ask questions. Um, it, it, next in the series of rapid fire cool showcases, uh, I showed you earlier the example of Jan Sherman. She has implants in her brain. She's able to control a robotic device. It's very reasonable to expect that you might not just want to control a robotic device, you might want to control your own body. And so this is functional electrical stimulation work that from down, down in Cleveland, the FES clinic there. And what it's looking at doing is saying, you know, someone might still have a paralysis, might be actually paralyzed from the neck down, but instead of trying to control devices to support them, maybe we can just run wires that, that sort of skip step the break in the spinal column. New wires, run a new nervous system under the skin and into the muscles, so that when the person thinks about moving their arm, electrical stimulation allows them to actually remote control the muscles of their own body. This is really cool, and like I'm showing you that wiring diagram there, because this is actually how it works. There's wires that go on the outside of the body, and they either go through the skin, or they wirelessly transmit to boxes under the skin, and then wires actually fan out under the person's skin to control the muscles in their body and to record information from the muscles and nerves in the body. Okay, people are just looking kind of impressed. I think this is super cool. Like science fiction books like decades and decades ago sort of painted this as like the, the super far future, and we're seeing people using these technologies now. In, in research labs around the world. Getting a little more remote, this is another, another example. It's from um, EPFL, this is 
uh, Jose de la Milan's team and, and others there. And this is someone using signals recorded from the surface of their brain, so no wires into the body, just a cap on their head, to drive a wheelchair around. And what's cool about this example as well is that it's actually a collaboration with the wheelchair. The wheelchair has computer vision, the wheelchair can actually perceive things about the world around it, and work with the person controlling it to navigate the environment. So it's an example of someone with uh, perhaps a lower bandwidth or a less, less precise form of brain-body machine interaction working with an intelligent system so that they can actually interact with the world around them. Uh, the interaction can be also non-invasive in terms of the wiring, but invasive in terms of implants. I'm showing you here some what's called uh, a set of IME sens sensors or implantable muscle sensors. Think of these as larger than grain of rice size devices that can be implanted semi-permanently into the muscle tissue of the human body. So now instead of running wires under the skin, you have a bunch of wireless devices that are recording directly from the muscles and someday the nerves of the body while you're running around. So you don't have to worry about how the electrical interfaces from, your, uh, from a, a device to the skin are, are affected. You, this kind of technology allows essentially persistent long-term monitoring of information from inside the body to be communicated to assistive devices that support that body. Uh, this is also really cool and there's been some great studies where these devices have been implanted for longer periods of time and in fact are, are being, are, I think in some cases haven't been explanted for over a decade. So there's like really nice long-term stable deployments of, of technologies like this. What's really cool is that this comes at the same time we're starting to see actual learning technologies, machine learning technologies, not just being applied in, in research clinics. I showed you a lot of examples of, of things happening in research labs around the world. Uh, but we're also seeing advanced technologies being applied commercially. So people with prosthetic uh, needs are being fitted with what we, what we call pattern recognition prostheses or, or artificial robotic limbs that use machine learning to do their job. Those are now being prescribed in clinics. People are actually have access to them both in North America and Europe and, and other places around the world. So we're starting to see that, that the advanced informational and computational and robotic technology is no longer a thing of research labs. It's something that, that people are using and people are using on a regular basis. And I do mean that, because it's not even that this is something limited to medicine. These are devices that like, you could go on Amazon or go to your favorite big, big box store, and for a couple hundred bucks, you could buy either of these devices. I think Thalmic, I think Thalmic stopped producing the BIOS, so this slide slightly a lie, but as of a couple of months ago, anyone could go on and buy these, these two devices. Um, one of the devices is like, it's a band that goes around your arm, records signals from your muscles. You can use it to like give the slideshow I'm giving right now, fly a quadcopter, like uh, paint a picture on a, on a drawing program. So this is, we used to, as researchers, spend hundreds of thousands of dollars to get rigs like this in our labs. We have to open our labs with these expensive pieces of medical hardware. And now anyone can go in like Amazon and two days later, like the knock, knock on the door and you have brain-body machine interface hardware. The other one's an EG headset. It actually records from the surface, electrical signals from the brain the surface of the, of the skin. So these devices are now commercially available. Anyone can use them. And in fact, like, this is maybe one of the bigger points as well, is that a lot of other technologies, like most of you have computers out in front of you, people have phones. I, we are starting to use technologies in a persistent way to interact with, with different forms of assistive machinery that we never did before. And this is just one example. And I think the bullet point, the reason I showed you all of those cool things, I was like, oh yeah, look at all this neat neurotechnology, not because I want you to like understand the way the world is changing. I do. I think that's important. But mainly I want to make this point, is that in fact all of those examples use some form of machine learning or advanced computing. So when Jan Sherman is trying to move a robotic arm, the, the technology is monitoring signals generated from a brain, understanding the patterns in those signals and mapping them to the movements of that robotic arm. In the case of the person controlling those two bionic limbs, there's patterns in the muscle activity that are being mapped to control actions. Ditto you know, for the wheelchair and for all these other examples. Even the way that bio armband you might get at Best Buy can be connected to your computer. It, there's a training routine, you move your, your wrist around, it learns the patterns of your arm and, and then maps your intent into the device around you. So that's what's really cool is that all these devices, and yes, your cell phones as well, I'm sure if you, if you have, I think probably the Apple, I think now uses deep neural networks to do face categorization in the, uh, the Photos app. So I know my phone, my phone will be like, hey look, there's a picture of me, there's a picture of my mom. That's being done with machine learning and machine intelligence. So we're all using this technology on a regular basis, and it's really the glue. And this, this is another huge point that I'm hoping to convey today, is that, is that machine intelligence is in fact becoming that fundamental glue that connects the human body and the human will to the assistive machines that support us in our daily life. Does everyone buy that argument? Just a quick check. Like, you, you see that in your own, maybe your own technologies as you're all typing, and it's like auto-completed for you and things like that. Right, cool. Um, 
So before we do that, then let's just sort of zoom out. I promise to zoom out, and I do, I do intend to do so. So maybe starting is like, what are the hallmarks of intelligence? If we're going to talk clearly about intelligence, we're going to talk about machine intelligence, I think it's important that we all at least have some kind of working understanding of what this intelligence thing is, like wetware, hardware, whatever you want. Um, so maybe shout out something, like, what's intelligence? What, what do you folks think? Yeah, I haven't really shot in the dark, but I think intelligence is the ability to form and understand patterns in the natural world. Yeah, that's a great one. Like, there's a lot of information in this wild, squishy world, and, and we, we believe that there's patterns in there. We use those patterns to make good decisions, so absolutely. Uh, so another hand going up over on the other side here. No? Okay, you're just like moving back. Yeah, please. The ability to be like rational. Ooh, we just actually, I was at a neuroscience workshop earlier, we were talking all about rationality and whether that actually exists, especially in economics. And the answer, I think folks like Dan and Riley would publish whole books saying, that, no, no, we're just like super not rational. And in fact, we, we can't aspire to that. But, but we do hope that we'll make good decisions based on the information presented to us. So maybe if I can, if I can do like epsilon rational or soft rational, um, I think we can see that most of the biological systems around us exhibit some form of trying to make, uh, not maybe an optimal decision making, but at least effective decision making. Uh, so rationality, I'm just picking on the word rationality, but I think uh, I'll soften that a bit to say, yeah, I think that, it's a, that we do see this in many of the systems that we interact with, maybe all of them. Other, other ideas? Um, the ability to premeditate. Ooh, premeditate. Some people also talk about planning, um, and many people mean many different things about planning, but yes, the, the idea that, I mean, we, we will be taking actions in the future, and in fact, those actions are sort of based on expectations about what might happen, which is kind of cool, because I'm going to bring up the idea of predictions or forecasts of the future soon. So I think that that's a neat one, and it's something that, like, it, it, intelligence, I think, as we see it, as we look around the room, goes beyond just being reactive. It goes to being proactive. And so I think that that's, a, that's a neat point as well. Most people don't bring it up, actually, when I ask this question in this, in this talk, so I, I like that you, you brought that one up. Um, maybe one or two others? Yeah, please. Um, well, in context to uh, rationality, there's also emotional intelligence, which is a very human aspect that is like being applied in the machine field as well. Absolutely. And I mean, I, I, like, I like that you brought this up as well, because I can zoom out of emotional intelligence and go all the way to something that's sort of big and scary, which is theory of mind. And so I think that this is something that the more advanced systems that interact with us and, and that we interact with, like when we're all interacting, there's a lot of good arguments to say that we're actually building up some kind of model of each other's minds. And, and emotional intelligence, good emotional intelligence, as we see like, you know, really good CEO with, with really good like emotional quotient can actually interact much better with those around them. Some people would argue that's because that they have a really like very well polished theory of mind for the other individuals. Maybe they're just really, really good at gaming the system, but I think it actually goes back towards having a, a interesting theory of mind. And so this is something that we do ascribe to more advanced forms of intelligence. Uh, one more. I like this. You're all, you're all wonderful. I just like these are great. These are great comments. Um, or we can go on. That's good. No. Okay. I'm gonna move on. Um, I'm gonna say that everything you said is totally how I I agree with all that stuff. Uh, and I'm gonna take one sort of cross section through intelligence today. And you don't have to agree with it, but I just want to throw it out to you <coughs> as as something as a a just a, a piece of, of my my perspective that you can use if you like it to understand intelligence. And I'm going to say that many of the things we just talked about involve the relationship between data or information and goals. It's the idea that we might have uh, information coming from the world, sensory information, decision-making fodder, and that intelligent systems are attempting to pursue goals. They, are, they have objectives in the world. And, and what ties these two things together is, is the fact that they make decisions. So if we think about intelligence through the lens of data, goals, and the decisions that tie them together, um, we can start to see the threads or the through lines that move through this process of taking sensation and moving it into to the, the achievement or attainment of goals and the means by which a system might achieve those goals. And one piece is perception, more than just the, the, the raw presentation of the data, but being able to perceive or represent the information that is coming in from the world around a thinking system. This is, I think, a thread that moves through this. Um, I, I mentioned that I mentioned prediction. Uh, you might also, if you, depending on your, your presuppositions, think of it as knowledge, but the idea that we might understand patterns in the world. Patterns were brought up as well, and, then, and the idea that, that maybe that there's some regularity to these patterns. Maybe we can, in fact, tell something about what will happen next based on what's already happened. Uh, we can understand something about the regularities. And then, taking into account this present perception or representation of the world and, and the way that we can understand the patterns based on it, then systems begin to take action. 
they form policies, they engage with the world so that they can change the world. I think these are some very strong hallmarks of intelligence in all its different forms. Again, it's one lens by which to understand it, and, and for me, at least from a research perspective, taking this perspective has been really helpful in pursuing my research. Um, Okay, so now that we have those as sort of a, a baseline and also all of your comments, we're going to play a very quick game called Intelligent or Not. And the idea is that I show you something on the screen and you tell me whether it's intelligent. You say yes or no, or anything else. Intelligent or not, toaster? Probably not. Oh, okay. Aruba, in fact. Uh, people aren't answering, people shout out. What's that? No. No? Okay, we've already have, we have bias. We have like bellwether effects in the crowd. Cool, that's all right. Um, intelligent or not, it's one of these thingies that you talk to, it like shops for you, understands what you say, maybe gets your recipe while you're cooking. Probably not. Probably not? Yeah. All right. Uh, that, yeah. Yes. No, okay, I'm looking at it. Um, this robot here can like pick up objects, put them in trash cans, it can speak 16 languages, it can tell you the three, three laws of robotics when you ask it. If you look at it, it'll like make eye contact and follow you as you move around. Ooh, we got a hard crowd today, all right. Cool, well, um, so I think you just flat out ruled out every single thing except maybe me as, uh, as being intelligent, and that's, that's cool. So it was funny, I gave, a, I gave this actually the same talk to the uh, U of A alumni folks at the Educated Luncheon yesterday, and right from Toaster, I started getting, yes, intelligent, right from Toaster. So it was a very different, I, I, I actually enjoyed this part of it as well, so I can sort of see how different people perceive it. Um, so I, I, I like doing that first because I want to try to dispel some common misconceptions about intelligence. Because if we want to talk about intelligence, especially machine intelligence, and we want to say how we might begin to deploy intelligent machinery in the things we do in our daily life, especially in medicine, if we're falling into the trap of improperly or unclearly separating out different forms of intelligence, we, we might not be actually solving the problems we think we're solving. It might cause a lot of trouble in the process. So here's the first misconception is that like everything that in fact has any kind of agency or autonomy, anything that has any animation to it at all, is AI. This is sometimes you see this perspective in the, uh, in the popular press, you see this uh, talking to people on the street, like this is one of the perceptions that we, we see. It permeates the way that we think about our advanced technologies is that, wow, every single thing that I just mentioned is definitely AI. All right, except maybe me, I'm, I'm probably not sure. But uh, the idea that this is all AI, and in fact, I think it comes out of more of a natural progression that looks more like this, which is that at a certain point, once we gain familiarity with an advanced technology, it goes from being AI to an appliance. And now we see this like the toaster. Like toasters nowadays do all sorts of crazy things. They have sensors in them. They try to figure out how to not burn your toast. They probably talk to the internet. I have no idea. Toasters are actually fairly advanced pieces of autonomous machinery when you get right down to it. Um, Roombas are even more so. They're, they have like physical autonomy. They move around the room, they vacuum, they try to find their little docking station. If you would have shown a Roomba to someone in the 1950s who was like pursuing basic machinery for intelligence, they would think that you'd solved AI. They're like, you have just solved all the problems of it. We're done. Okay, cool. Check out. This is fine. Um, but now we, we're like, oh yeah, no, that's an appliance. I'll go buy that at the store. I've got a better one now. We, we start to treat intelligent systems as appliances and we become, become more familiar with their operation and, and their, their both pros and cons. And, but there's still a line where someone will draw a line and say, no, no, everything after this point is no longer an appliance, it's clearly AI. And right now, like, robots that look like people definitely fall on the side, regardless of whether they're intelligent, are not appliances. They're lumped into, into that AI bin. So I'd like instead, I'd like us to try to think of it like this. Those lines are sort of squishy lines and they don't help us discuss intelligent systems well, but if we take sort of the, the uh, perspective of data decisions and goals, especially where we think that these are facilitated by things like perception, prediction or knowledge generation and the ability to take action, then we can start to think about intelligence as a, as a continuum or as many, many different axes that we should all think about very precisely. Um, I'm not that great at math. My Excel spreadsheets probably do a much better job at math than I do. That's great. There are automatic translation programs that can translate what I'm saying right now into everything from Japanese to Icelandic or between two languages they, that they've never even seen before. This is a very advanced, what used to be considered a very advanced cognitive act. It's better than a lot of people can do. And that's great. But that same system probably can't also vacuum your house. So I think it's very important that as we start to say something is or is not exhibiting some of the hallmarks of intelligence that we discussed, we say what hallmarks is it exhibiting and in what context? And, and by doing this, I think we can talk much more clearly about intelligence, about machine intelligence, and then how that will interact with the other things we do in our daily life. So this is my pitch to you, is that when you're, when you're talking to others, you're talking about things like AI, 
please be very precise. Like, try to, try to break down what kinds of intelligence you're talking about. Because that means that, again, intelligent toasters are not going to be viewed as an existential threat. But maybe the things that actually are something we need to be concerned about or think hard about will actually get the attention they deserve. So let's not conflate toasters with, with robots uh, that move around and interact with the world with drones that fly through the sky, with internet agents that buy and sell stock shares. Like, these are different things. Let's think about them differently and how they're intelligent and what that means to us. Is everyone okay with that? That's like my soapbox, <laughs> my soapbox rant for the day. Everyone's, everyone's cool with that? Okay. Um, yeah, so if we, if we believe all of that, and we believe we can talk clearly about it, the next thing to talk about is why people might actually care about machine intelligence. And I'm assuming Osmar has told you this as well in different words, so I'm just going to say it again, because I, I, I think it's important. Um, why might we actually want machine intelligence? And one is that I think, and this is my, my speculation, is that it gives us as a species a feeling of enhanced control over this very large, complex world. Uh, it allows us to be better able to, to modulate and interact with the environment around us. This is one reason why we pursue machine intelligence. And maybe this comes from the next point, which is that machine intelligence also promises us something that has been, I think, central to society since we've been rolling knuckle bones of sheets in, cave, in caves or like looking into pieces of like murky glass and trying to see the future. Like, machine intelligence gives us something like a farmer's almanac or, or that crystal ball to peer into what's going to happen next. Forecasting the future is something that, that we try to do. Our brains are designed to do this. And in fact, we hope to do it better. Machine intelligence is one way that we might begin to see small glimpses of the future, especially in very specialized domains. Um, the, fi the final piece is really that it does also promise us very general tools for solving pretty hard problems. It's like the Swiss army knife of technologies. Uh, I think it was Ray Kurzweil said that intelligence is the most powerful phenomenon in the universe. And if you think about that, yes, we're, we're starting to find out how we can leverage the most powerful phenomena in the universe to help us gain better control over the world around us and to understand that world. So that's, a, I think, why people care about machine intelligence. And so the next bit is actually going to be why they care about, uh, why would they care about machine learning? So this example, it's a modern example, it's uh, my, my now graduate student, Gotham Boston. Gotham's now with Kindred AI, uh, doing some cool stuff with robot manipulation. But here's Gotham shaking a robot's hand. And the, the key point here I want you to see is that that's like the worst handshake ever. Not Gotham's fault. Gotham's good at giving handshakes. Very, very good handshake at his part. Uh, but the robot arm is like, this is, he would never get a job. Like, you go and walk and shake the interviewer's hand. That, that wouldn't do it. Um, and the reason I bring this up is because I think that really we have to talk not just about intelligent systems, but about learning systems. And this is something that, that didn't really come up very firmly in the, the hallmarks of intelligence we just discussed earlier, is that, that we also might expect a hallmark of intelligence is the, the capability to adapt or change over time. And so this is really learning. Like, we'd expect that that robot should be able to get better at shaking Gotham's hand. We might hope that, in fact, they can watch Gotham shake someone else's hand and then get better at shaking hands just based on that, that learning from demonstration. Um, so this, this gets into why learning. Like, why should we care about a learning machine, not just an intelligent machine? And one is that, really, we can imagine a setting where we know what we want to achieve, but we have no way of, of, no way of figuring out how to actually achieve it. This is a great setting for, for reinforcement learning, as I hope you'll hear from Rich later on, that... that you can imagine that we know, like, say, when a robot arm has picked up a cup, but maybe we're not good enough programmers or designers or engineers to figure out how to program the robot arm to pick up the cup. But we know what we want. So we can actually have a system that will learn to, to do the things we wish it to do without us knowing actually how it might do them. This is one promise of learning. The other is that, in fact, we actually know how to solve the problem. We actually know how to engineer a solution. But we might not be able to actually do this in a practical way. We may not be able to scale, scale up our solution methods to the scale of the problem we care about. I was thinking like, you know, we could all solve maybe one small math problem, but now if we're presented with 10,000 math problems, well, it's gonna take us a very, very long time to solve all those <coughs> problems. Engineering tasks are no different. There might be a case where you could program a really good policy for that robot arm that would actually give a great handshake, but the minute one of its motors wore down or we take it out in the cold, we'd have our entire team of engineers spending another six months writing another policy to make that arm do the exact same thing. So it might be that learning allows us to scale up things that we could actually solve by hand. Uh, and the last bit is really that I think the most important bit is that things change. Like the world is the world is a non-stationary world. The situation that our that we are immersed within, and also that our, our systems are, is is going to change. And learning allows systems to adapt allow, alongside their environment. So with that, I'm going to dive a little bit more into AI and in, in, in machine learning specifically in medicine. 
Okay, do, but before we do that, does anyone have any questions about the last bit? We sort of, this was the, we looked at all of the wild, wacky things we might do with neurotechnology and said they all come from machine learning and, and at their root, or at least that's my argument, is someone who thinks machine learning is important. Then we sort of zoomed out a bit and talked about intelligent systems and what's a hallmark of intelligence, how should we think about intelligence, and why would we care about it. And now we're going to dive back in a little bit and talk more about AI and medicine. Um, any questions with, uh, with the stuff we talked about so far? Silence. Everyone's checking Facebook or Twitter or something. Okay, cool. Um, all right. So then maybe I will move forward and just talk a little bit about sort of three ways I think, and, and can this relate to things that you think about on a regular basis? I know you've seen the slide, so you're like, ah, it's an old hat. But uh, um, there's three ways I think we can start to really tangibly notice the impact of things like artificial intelligence and machine learning in, in the medical envelope. And one of them is, is something I think many of my colleagues work on. I think Osmar almost certainly told you about this. and. and if you look at some of the other great work being done by my colleagues at Amy, you'll see that, that they do a lot of this, which is helping, like, helping to understand things like patient populations, whole, whole populations of individuals or examples through the use of, it, of AI and machine learning. So this is maybe understanding, uh, another example might be understanding the brain. Not your brain or your brain or your brain, but, but understanding how the brain works or how genomics works. Understanding co like, large concepts that exist at the level of populations or phenomena. This is one thing that I think is really a powerful use of, of artificial intelligence in medicine. And you can start to see, for instance, also patterns or trends. Again, going back to the comment about patterns, if you see like many, many, many different health, in, health instances within a, a particular setting, you can start to see like whole trends in a population. You can start to see time series trends, like wow, there's an influenza outbreak and it started here and it's moving in this direction. So you can start to see what's happening at a, at a patient population level. The next bit, though, that I think is really important is, is how any given person relates to what we know about populations. So like if we know about the brain, what do we know about Kim's brain with respect to the brain? And, and we might find that there's things that are very, that, that are very standard, and things that are not standard in the way that any individual relates to what we know about populations. In fact, this is a, one of the, the central bits, I think, in medicine, and being not a doctor myself of that particular kind, is that we, we look to say like we have experience with human health and human medicine. And then we see a new patient. We see someone new that comes into the clinic and presents with some, some condition or symptoms. How do they relate to what we know about population level medicine? And so machine learning <coughs> is actually one way that we can start to personalize the, the things that we know about population level health down to individuals. Uh, personalized medicine or prescription or, or precision health are great examples where maybe if we knew a little bit more about individuals and their lifestyles and their habits and their everything from their DNA to what they did in the morning and what their diet's like, we might be able to prescribe better medicines. We might be able to give exactly the right dosing strategy to someone instead of taking a one-size-fits-all approach to, say, pharmaceutical prescription. So this is just one example that you might imagine. You can have someone walk in, you get a little bit more information about them, and a system can help you dial in the right dose for their metabolism and their lifestyle. Okay? And this is no different if we go to other areas like physiatry. If you want to attach a robot limb to someone, or if you wish, hope someone to interact with a, with a wheelchair or in any other kind of assistive technology, we might imagine having intelligent systems that are able to best customize the shape or size of the seating solution that a wheelchair user might get, or the type of control strategy that, that someone might be suitable for with a, with a robotic limb like the ones I showed earlier. So this is the act of personalization. And the last bit, it's, it's very similar to personalization, but I think it's subtly different, is in fact optimization. And this might be how we actually boots on the ground connect people to their assistive technologies in the realm of physiatry, or how we help deploy treatment strategies. And so this is more of a, a closed loop kind of iterative process, but like imagine those robotic arms I showed you, we should hope that they are adapting to the person using them and getting better with time, getting better as they learn about the person who's using them. And so I think these are three big areas where we can start to see the, the real tangible impact of already existing forms of AI and ML in, in medicine. And the usual question that comes up, and I'm sure many of you are like, oh yes, it's like, well, do we just replace doctors? And I, I think this is actually maybe missing the subtleties of these points, was when people ask that question. It's in fact that we are, through the use of in intelligent system technology and advanced technologies, we're looking at how we can begin to allow people to make better decisions. So it's really a decision support kind of setting that we can imagine. The example I like to see is like, let's imagine that, that a doctor in a clinic has seen three examples of a particular condition in their entire life. Okay, and now a new patient comes in with a similar kind of condition. 
So normally the doctor will, without calling or getting consults from their friends, will compare this new patient to the other three examples they've seen. Now imagine there's 300,000 cases in the entire world. So one role for machine learning in helping make this clinical care practitioner better able to do the job is to allow them to access the insight from those other 300,000 cases. They've seen three of them, but there's a lot more out there. So one, one very nice thing is like not to say, oh yes, we're going to just have a machine look at all those cases and make a decision about prescription or treatment. It's to say, when someone is trying to make a decision, well, what would happen? Like in all cases that look like my new patient, what happened if I gave them this treatment or this treatment? Hey, can you tell me what the long-term rollout consequence is? <coughs> Any of these patients had a survival rate of like over 50 years? Why? What was their lifestyle like? The ability to provide decision support based on massive sets of data that can't be synthesized by hand or in any aggregate way in, in normal, normal processes, again, the scale problem we talked about earlier, is one way that systems can begin to provide decision support for human experts. So I, this is, I, I want to make this point because I, I do hear quite often, well, is this kind of stuff replacing doctors? And the answer is no, no, it's helping, it's helping people do a better job of what they do. Uh, anyone who's gone in for radiology lately, you don't actually don't say it, it doesn't matter. If you have gone in for radiology lately, um, like my wife went in for an ultrasound, we had a baby two years ago. Um, she had a baby, I helped. Uh, but uh, went in for ultrasound, and uh, like, it, the, the ultrasound technician like did a scan, drew some lines on the screen, and got a heartbeat out. They weren't sitting there with stopwatches or doing all these funny things. They, the, the technician was using the technology to extract complex patterns out of a bunch of like, white, gray, and black pixels. That's not, a, that's not a case of replacing the technician. It's allowing the technician to see more people. Like maybe if, if that technician was sitting there like with a stopwatch and trying to figure out where the pixels were, the ruler and things like that, maybe that they'd only get to scan one person every hour, every two or three hours, as opposed to a very nice fast cycle of healthcare. So I think this is a, it's a compelling example of how the more advanced the, the, the computing technology becomes, the better able our healthcare system is able to inexpensively provide care to people who need it in a timely, in a timely way. So I think that that, like, because you'll probably all hear this as well, like, ah, machines are replacing X, Y, or Z. Uh, think, when you hear this, don't just, I mean, don't obviously agree or reject it right out, but think, is it really a case of a replacement or is it a case of changing and improving the way that someone might be doing the thing that they're hoping to do? Okay, as low as it works. I am going to show you now a quick example. This is from our, our lab. I just want to zero in on, on some of the thoughts about optimization. Uh, this is from our lab. We have a gentleman here using one of our prototype 3D printed robot arms to pick up a series of objects using control signals from his muscles. And uh, here, one thing I want you to zero in on here is that this is a, a task that involves manipulating small objects. And it's really slow and painful. Like this gentleman is actually, it's taking quite a bit of time to, to control this robot arm. And it's a very awkward process of switching between different control modes or functions and then trying to select the right ones to achieve the task. Uh, this is, well, it, the, you might just say, oh, well, that's, you have a bad research prototype. It, in fact, this, is the, this kind of switched control is very common. In fact, the dominant way that people control their myelectric prostheses that are prescribed in the clinic. So like, can we do better? And what I want to show is one example. This is some of the thesis work of my student, Dylan Grenius. Um, he's doing some work on saying, well, you know, can we by allowing a little bit of self-optimization, by allowing a system to take on some autonomy, can it actually sol start solving this problem? So what Dylan did was something really simple. He used the insight that, well, you know, that was really slow and painful because the person's controlling all of those different joints. So in, co in, sort of in concert with our occupational therapist, Dylan built what he called a self-leveling wrist. You can see it actually working here. It's a, imagine you're holding a coffee cup. If I move my arm up in the air, my, my coffee cup just doesn't go flying. My wrist compensates for where gravity is. I can move my hand around and I don't spill my coffee. It's so much, my hand is, in, in some cases, in concert with the rest of my body, uh, doing some form of autonomous fine grain control. So it totally makes sense then that, in this case, here's the auto level wrist again, is that as this person is using this, this simulator bypass prosthesis to move objects, is that the wrist itself is sort of moving and leveling so that the task becomes a lot easier. This is one way that even a very simple form of machine intelligence can start to offload some of that, that control requirement of, from the human and allow the person who's making the decisions to actually make better, higher level decisions without all of that slow, painstaking manipulation you saw in that first example. But as we move forward, we want actually something more like this. That was just an example of some smooth control of, of a single joint. But we're expecting, like, this is a robot system in the lab. And as you can see, this is the modular prosthetic limb. It's the uh, third generation of, of one of the most advanced prosthetic limbs on the planet. Is that it can perform to a first approximation many of the motions that a human biological limb can perform. So that like the problem isn't even the robots. I mean, we have robot arms that can perform very 
and you can see a little bit of jerkiness here, but that's not even really the, that's more the, the fault of the, the control than is the, the actual capabilities of the arm. Like, we have arms that can do the things we need them to do. It, gluing that to the person, being able to connect a person to a machine such they can control a system like this, especially when, as a level of injury or illness increases, that we have less ability to record from their body to monitor what they actually want, and then pass it out to the world. This is, I think, the really large challenge. And so this is where, specifically, there's a great role for machine intelligence in gluing people to technology like this, in interpreting a limited set of signals or cues or, in, or acts of will on the part of the human user, and letting their technology then affect much more complex, coordinated, or principled movements that, that match and naturally fit to the environment the person is interacting within. So I think this is a really important, a really important role for machine intelligence. So that's like think of this as the, the pipeline of optimization. Someone slowly and painstakingly controlling everything to, to solve a task. The machine is able to take on some of the natural functions that are, that are appropriately suited for the task. To the person is giving just the right level of queuing and coordination, and the machine's able to fill in the gaps. It's able to essentially, like a good, like the person being a CEO of a very good company. The CEO chooses the direction and, and actually the, shapes the way a company moves, but the CEO isn't the one that is perhaps filing the paperwork or, or cleaning the floors or making that purchase acquisition. So I think this is a really a, a nice model that we can start to see where machine intelligence will allow someone's control authority to scale to much more complex interaction settings. And in case, just in case you were wondering what robots are up to these days, this is one of the robot videos from Boston Dynamics. Maybe some of you have seen it. Um, I think it's neat because we often we often see robots doing very sort of stilted things, and here we're seeing a robot doing like acts of gymnastics. There's also a parkour example where it's like running up these multiple objects. Um, but our robots are now getting incredibly advanced. Like, <laughs> it's really quite impressive the the kinds of coordination patterns that our robotic systems can can do nowadays, and the robustness that these systems have. Like, look at the flex and the there's actually flexion in those joints. It's able to absorb and be compliant and and sort of absorb the shock. Uh, I like showing Boston Dynamics, if you haven't seen their videos, are fantastic, because they also put blooper reels at the end of every one of their videos, and so you can see that, like, just in case you're worried that robots are getting way too good at stuff, like, that, it didn't really stick that landing pretty well, that's more like how I land backflips, um, or maybe I land backflips more like this, <laughs> but, like, um, the, the point, though, is that our robotic systems are becoming much more capable, like that robot arm I showed you that's doing a backflip, the fact that it can fall on its face and not cause a million dollars worth of repair damage, like that itself is something spectacular. And the reason I show that isn't just to show you cool robots, I, I do like doing that. Uh, but because I'm gonna show you this video next. And this is uh, someone with, like there's people either with paralysis or with neurodegenerative issues or with other kinds of complications that mean they can't move, are now affixing robots to their body there. Like there's a case as well where we might hope to have robotic devices support our biological bodies. I showed you a lot of examples of prosthetics, but I didn't show you exoskeletons. And so I want to show you this specifically for that reason, is that if you see the potential of the robot systems that we have, like that robot doing backflips, and you imagine now that people can wear robots, that everyone from people with neurodegenerative illnesses to the elderly, Japan is one of the leaders in exoskeleton technologies because there's such a huge aging population. And so they're looking at exoskeletons for, for, for normal people that allow them to live an autonomous life well into their old age. And so our robots and our people need to work together. And again, my argument for, for you today is that, in fact, one of the key things that allows us to put people and, and our assistive devices together is the intelligent systems technology, is the, the information processing and data processing and, and that coordination communication that a advanced computing technology allows. So I'm gonna say controversial things. I'm allowed to say controversial things now. They gave me tenure so I can say stuff like this. Um, is that as we move forward, I think we're going to see a very different world in terms of clinical care, and I think we're already seeing this world. And in particular, the, the point that I'd like to make is that if we, if we believe a patient's body, someone comes into the clinic, and we believe that their body and also their mind are comprised of both biology and technology, then how do we treat the whole patient? I want to say it again, because it's important. If, if people are made of both biology and technology, and our goal is to treat the whole patient, can our current system and can our current approaches treat the whole patient? And as supporting points, we can see that, especially in the case of assistive technologies, that patients sometimes, and in fact in many cases, do consider their technology to be part of themselves. Yes, please. Sorry. Uh, so when you say the compressible biology and technology, do you mean it in the sense like in the future when you have these prosthetic bionic implants and skeletons, or what do you mean by technology? Uh, and so I actually mean right now and in the future. So, so the answer is yes, I do mean that. 
uh, but also the fact that even people today using robotic artificial limbs or even mechanical artificial limbs, they do start to feel like these technologies are part of themselves. So like a pacemaker? Would Absolutely. Pacemakers, we have like the more and more assistive technology we use, even sometimes technologies like, I don't know how many of you go into a panic if you can't find your phone. Anyone? No? People are, we see this sometimes, that people get incredibly attached to assistive devices like even their cell phones. It becomes an extension of the point that if that thing is missing, if I were to take out the batteries of one of your phones, we could like do a little case study. We're all stuck in this room for another hour and I'd take out your phone batteries. And just watch and see what happens. And some people might start panicking. Because of this exact point is that we start to consider the technology that assists us because we take action through that technology and we receive stimulus through that technology. Like we feel like it becomes a part of ourselves, whether we say our cell phone is our body or whether we just treat it like our body. Uh, this is something that happens if like, it's, it's the rubber hand illusion writ large. Like you, you have a rubber hand, you convince someone it's their own hand, and then someone hits it with a hammer and the person flinches, even though like they know this is a piece of rubber. The same thing is true for, for technologies like our phone, and the same thing is certainly true for intimately connected technologies, especially imagine like an osseointegrated limb or like a pacemaker. So this gets to the second point, which is that biology and technology are becoming less and less separable. And in fact, this means in my mind that biological and technical care are also less and less separable. Like again, do you want to remove someone's pacemaker to reflash the firmware? Ideally not. If someone is like has an entire low, lower body that is robotic so they can locomote, and you were to take that away, that would be a that would be a problem. If you send it back for warranty services, you better darn well have a perfectly identical replacement to put back. Especially if those technologies are adapting or changing on a daily basis to personalize to a person. If it's not just a stock factory device, but in fact an artificial limb that has learned to interpret that person's unique muscular signatures, they would have to go through an extended learning pr process perhaps to get a new device. So it is in fact becoming part of them. And so this is why I'm saying that I think normal care, or normal clinical care, not even in the 10 year window, but in the short term, is going to, and it already does, involve not just experts in things like the muscles or the nerves or the bones of the human body, but also hardware and software folks, data science folks. Like, I, we're starting to see this already, and I think it's only going to become more prominent that if you want to treat someone with an artificial limb, maybe you need both clinical care providers who know the biology and also those who know the engineering and the technology of those devices to, say, reflash the firmware and then help that person adapt to that new technology once it's been upgraded. So I'm, gonna, I'm actually going to close and just give us some time for questions. I think probably I'm, I'm far ahead of time here, but that's all right. We can have some questions. Yeah, no, this is actually perfect. Um, is that what I've told you about largely has been the way that we start to think about connecting the human body to an assistive machine. And the main point I made earlier on, the point that I made uh, through the first few slides, in fact, is that, that machine intelligence is becoming the glue, and in many cases is the glue, that connects all of those signals that are recorded from the human body and transmitted to the human body with all those signals that are recorded from and transmitted to the assistive device that is helping that person live their daily life. But the point is bigger than this, and so I, I like to switch it with this slide here, which is saying that in fact it's more about less, less about connecting a human to an assistive machine and more about connecting the human mind to the world around it, the world that it's situated within, and extending the bounds of our perception, our action, and our cognition well beyond the normal biological limits. And this could be biological limits that have been reduced due to injury or illness, or it might be the biological limits of our, 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 innate, our innate human or learned human abilities for, to, to perceive, act, and cognate. And so this is why I say this, I, I show human mind, but I put not just for patients as we've largely talked about today, but also for caregivers, for policymakers. I think that we're seeing machine intelligence is in fact the thing that allows us to extend ourselves out of that world and, and take information from the world back into ourselves. This is the grand promise and why I like this to fit with the theme of promise and perils of AI that, that Kim has set for this particular stream of the course. Because this is the promise of, of machine intelligence, I think. It's to allow us to do things we never could before and to augment our abilities in ways that were never previously possible, whether it's recovering from injury or illness or extending our innate or learned abilities. Um, so with that, I'm going to close. I'm actually, I've actually started just putting the, uh, the Amy contact slide on the back because I actually stopped answering email, much to Kim's frustration, I know. I just don't read my email more than once every couple of weeks, and I stopped doing meetings, too. It's actually really handy. It's amazing how much work you can get done. Uh, but uh, so if you do want to connect with me, uh, Kim obviously can get a hold of me sometimes. Actually, no, I'm not going to promise that. <laughs> no end of frustration for the four gentlemen. I'm sorry, Kim, I apologize. Uh, but uh, I will actually say if you do want any more information about machine intelligence in general, then there's a lot of great resources at, at Amy, and we're building up more of them as well. And, and it helps you see the, the broader scope of the work we're doing, not just at the university, but as a, as a province to, to really enhance the, our understanding and our deployment of, of intelligence systems technology.
Anyway, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to close a little early and uh, and then open it up for questions. Then you can talk a bit more about this if you're interested, or you can all just leave early. And that's fine too. Questions? That's a lot of information. Yeah, I know. Whirlwind tour. It's dialed in for about an hour because at this pace, any more than an hour, people's heads start exploding. And I start so um, the uh, metrics for AI in Edmonton, like I've I've been telling people we're third ranked in the world. So what is that based on? Uh, or? <coughs> metrics are silly, and we should never use them. I, I don't like metrics. Uh, <laughs> depending on which source or what way you right. date your metrics, uh, you get all sorts of answers. I don't like metrics in general. We show up pretty pretty well on the metrics. Yeah. Uh, but that same way, metrics are based on things like publication counts, and, and maybe right. that's only a, a, like the same with the faculty evaluation process. Right. I can say all sorts of controversial things on camera. Uh, <laughs> is that, that really we're measuring proxies for what we actually care about. And yeah. so what I like to think about is not so much like what's the, like how many papers have we produced and then what does that mean in terms of ranking versus like Carnegie Mellon or whatever it is that, that we're, we're, we're compared against. I like to think instead what's our impact in terms of how we've changed the thinking of other people yeah. in the world and how their thinking has allowed us to do other things. So we're, we're top of the class. We're, yeah. we're the best place in the world, especially for reinforcement learning research. I can yeah. say that people hands down. People here as thought leaders. Yeah. And, and, and where you can show yeah. you know, the impact of that. And the impact is leader. not just our papers. The impact is the people who have stayed here or trained here or grew here and what they've done when they've gone out in the world. And this is the really hard thing to measure, but if you look where our graduates have gone, the graduates from the University of Alberta that we've trained in machine learning and artificial intelligence and, and other, other forms of, of thinking machines and intelligent systems, those people have gone on to become the leaders in industry, the leaders in academia. They've, they've initiated some of the, the most impressive demonstrations and projects that we see around the world. So when I think about the impact of the University of Alberta, uh, I really think that we can see it in our ambassadors, our knowledge ambassadors have gone out to the world around us. And so this is great. It also means that because of this, we're able to bring some of those people back home to help grow the next generation of, of leaders, and we're also able to, to really bring back all of the rest of the knowledge from the world to help us see a more full picture of, of, of how this field is evolving. So, as, like, sure, we're, we do great by measures like papers and number of chairs and number of grants and, and graduated students. Those are all good measures. Sure, we do well on all of those measures. We stack up great compared to others in the world. In terms of paper counts, the field is exploding, and so paper counts are becoming even less, I think, a valid measure of, of like how, how impactful an area is. There's a lot of noise. Dale Sherman's, I don't know if he's going to talk in the course. I'm going to paraphrase Dale. I have to go meet Dale right after this, so he can help me if I misparaphrase. But uh, it said, really, we're entering perhaps an era of noise, and we have to be very careful in this era of noise to, to work extra hard to try to find the signal, to try to find the, 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 the sort of the, the grounding or the foundations of new, new ideas. And so, my optimism is that, in fact, the University of Alberta has a lot of that solid, that solid work that is, that is, in fact, signal in an era of noise. And so we should celebrate that here. That's my, like, yay, you know, pom-poms and things. <laughs> U of A is great. Amy is great. We're all so good. Um, but I do believe. I think we're, like, we, we have something to offer that no one else in the world has to offer. There's other centers in the world doing amazing work. And we should celebrate that, too. But we're, for what we do, we are the very best in the world. Mm -hmm. um, uh, yeah. Maybe into more history, but how do we get to this point? Because this is a relatively new field, um, well, compared to like the other sciences, maybe. But I, I don't know. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah. It's a. It is a uh, compared to say uh, to compared to physics. Yeah. Yeah. I think we're, um, we're we're jumping in a little late. Yeah. Uh, but how did we? How did we get? How did the U of A? I guess. Yeah. Cement itself. Um, as such a leader compared to, you know, the other big universities like UBC, U of T. Yeah. Um, kind of persistence. I think the answer is persistence and, in fact, foresight. Uh, so I, it was funny. I, I was chuckling because I saw a great lecture a couple weeks back by some some of the uh, some of my, my senior colleagues who were talking about the history of AI. And they're like, all right, you young whippers. They actually showed old man Simpson waving his fist. I mean, like, all right, you young whippersnappers. Deep nets were not invented in 2012. AI didn't start in the year 2000. They're like, let's go back to, you know, the year 1940-something. Hey, there's these folks you might remember from back then, and they rattled off all the names of the the, the founding the founding minds in artificial intelligence, and started to unpack it. And said, you know, the deep nets that we're using all now, they look a heck of a lot like the ones that like Fukushima <coughs> produced in nineteen in the nineteen eighties. And it was anyway, it was quite. That's why I was chuckling at your comment. Is is that really most of much of what we do right now is identical to what we did say 30, 40 years ago? We just have better compute. 
um, and that allows us to explore new problems. The way that U of A has really started to grow as a leader, I think, is that um, we've had experts here for, for decades, in fact, and we've continued to invest. This is something that I, like, I can't often say, like, wow, great, good job. I actually have the government on here, so I can be like, actually, good job, government. We don't always say good job, government, for maintaining a long-term vision, but like, almost 20 years ago, the government's like, we need to invest in this area. It was earlier than it was, it wasn't hot and trendy then. It was like speculative, but then like, our funders continued to invest allowed us to attract the best in the world, like people like Rich Sutton, like provide resources to bring the best minds in the world here. And because there's great people here, more great people want to come to hang out with those people, talk to those people to grow ideas. And so we've, we've had a very slow, persistent, and concerted growth process whereby we attract the very best in the world, we train the very best in the world, and then attract more of the best in the world. And so we've, we've grown slowly, persistently, but because of that, we've been able to build up a talent base here that, that actually is world class. And that's something I think it's a good. It's a good model. It's a slow model. It also means that we're really bad about again publicizing what we do, and so maybe the rest of the world doesn't actually know how good we are. So the un, the un, uncovered gem. But uh, yeah. yeah, some of it it is like e even you can think about it as an argument between what is serious and what is is playing games serious because a lot of the 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 best work that's been done here is in that field. Right. So, so, and and it turns out that even if you are argue that playing games is not serious, other very serious things depend upon what we found out mm -hmm. studying playing games. Yeah, Mike Mike Bowling would be a great example. I wish Mike could, I don't know if Mike ever gives talks but, uh, for the course, but I, I, Mike gives great talks arguing why him playing games and solving games is actually critical to all other problems. And I like yeah. I totally buy this because it's great. It's like okay, yeah, we're looking at poker. Is it to solve poker? Well, what kind of game is poker? Poker is a game where chance is involved, there's uncertainty, there's imperfect information. What other games are like that? Oh, I don't know medicine. So it, it's really quite interesting to see when, like, to see Mike talk about how, like, the games are a good analog. And I'm, I'm trying to put on my best Michael Bowling hat here, and um, again, I'll do a bad job of it. But the games are a perfect analog for many of the decision making problems that we see in the world around us on a regular basis, and they let us study it, and quite frankly, have fun while we're doing it. And so, yeah, serious, serious games. We have a fantastic games group here that uh, that's studying all aspects of, of games. And I, I think that's that's something else that we've been able to just answer your question before to cultivate over over the years is to make sure that we don't, um, even when games were not in vogue and everyone's like biomedical research is the only thing you can be doing to get funding. I think we still managed to keep doing games. We just sometimes called it medicine, but it was still games <laughs> um, because it's a great lens to study some of the hardest problems that we know. Uh, so I think that's that's the, yeah that's a great that's a great point, Kim as well. More questions? Yeah, please. Uh, this is a pretty basic question, but when you talk about the idea of reinforcement learning, like I'm not really, or especially within the context of artificial intelligence, I'm not really sure like what the reinforcement is, because if you refer to humans and like reinforcement, there's things like natural motivators like food and money. So like within the context of computers and. Uh, artificial intelligence, how does the reinforcement come in? Mostly well, cookies. It's really hard to get them into floppy drives because we don't have floppy drives anymore, so we've had to figure out how to stuff them into USB 3 ports, but you know, I think it's pretty good. Chocolate chip usually works. Oatmeal is also good. Yeah. Um, <laughs> well, more seriously, uh, the, uh, the, the, I think the, the key insight is that if you, we think about learning through trial and error, you have a signal that says whether or not you're winning or losing. And you can think of that signal as perhaps the reward. It's a momentary signal, but our learning systems, especially our RL systems, are looking to, in some way, maximize not just their immediate, the immediate signal of how much they're winning, but the long-term signal of how much they're winning. Uh, in a biological setting, you can imagine that being like rewards for, for like you can imagine money as a proxy for that, that success measure. You can imagine nutrient safety, security. There's all sorts of ways you can start to frame the problem. But it really boils down to a single scalar number where bigger is better. So the system is really trying to maximize the number. So when we formulate a reinforcement learning problem, like imagine it's to, uh, to, to have like a swing up pendulum is one, is one kind of thing we do. Another is mountain car, it's a really simple toy domain. You're a little car, you're underpowered, and you can only sort of rock your car out of this valley. And you get negative reward on every single time step until you rock yourself out of the valley. So the system is motivated in this case. Like it's just a, a, it's part of the way the problem is specified is that it's bad to keep having to rock yourself up this hill and when you're done, it's great. Um, another is like a maze where you have a system moving through a maze and there's like a, a reward at the end. In a rat maze, that might be a piece of cheese. 
um, or a, a, like a little squirt of juice from a, from a juice bottle or something like that. But it, it all comes down to the problem formulation, which is that there is a some kind of tangible positive reward at, at, in certain situations in the environment. And that's the system then can start to build up estimations or approximations of what situations that number will be big and what situations that will be small, and then start to change the way it acts, change its policy to try to go to places where it expects in the long term to be receiving more of this positive signal. The positive signal itself, we can either treat it like a, a, a number, the reward hypothesis, there's a single scalar number that drives all of this kind of behavior, or we can actually, as problem specifiers or as interpreters, suggest that, oh, well, this is like a, it's a bonus for winning the game of chess. Like, regardless of how we frame it, it all boils down to a single, a single number where we, we, we make it such that the system is trying to make that number as big as possible when it sums it over, over the length of its experience in some way. We call that the return, just for terminology. You sort of sum over the expected future of your rewards that you receive, and that's the quantity you're trying to maximize in, in much of reinforcement. Which maybe, wait, only computing scientists? Did I miss yeah. it? Yeah. Okay. All on here. Did you do two, 366 already? 366, I'm planning on taking that next semester. Oh, ah, okay. So anyway, then yeah, you'll do that now. <laughs> 366, you, you'll, yeah, you'll get very familiar with that, I suspect. Mm -hmm. Also, just as a quick question. Because you're an expert in the field, do you think the public paranoia towards machine learning and artificial intelligence is actually founded on anything at all? I, it goes back to the toaster thing. Um, and I think that people are, of course, people are always unsettled when there are things that they don't understand. I don't think that we as a community perhaps have done a great job in helping people actually understand like what is an intelligent system technology, what's an intelligent toaster. Um, and so because of this, there's a lot of, I think things are getting conflated. Everything, like a toaster that doesn't burn your toast and a drone system that might be monitoring you from a higher atmosphere being conflated together into the same thing. Uh, and that is not helpful for discussion. Like I think that there's reasons why, again, this is the title Promise and Perils of AI. I think as with any technology, we have to be very careful about how we think about it, how we use it, the way we talk about it, the way we suggest using it. Like there's, th these are all really important factors. I don't think we're able to do that as well as we can because there's a lot of confusion as to what it is we're talking about. Nanotechnology went, went through the same thing, and now like look at where most of the nanotech patents are. I think it's uh, uh, makeup, actually. I think L'Oreal holds most of, the, uh, most of the nanotech patents. And like, it's cool, I think my wife has some cool new nail polish, it's not L'Oreal nail polish, but like, there's all these like micro-reflective properties and things that you could argue that that's one of the coolest outputs of nanotechnology. But that's also conflated with micro-robots that swim through your body and take apart your cells and fix them. Like, there's, there's so much confusion that we saw when there was the big nanotech boom as to like, what is and is not nanotechnology. I think we see the exact same thing happening with respect to artificial intelligence. And with nanotech at least, maybe this is just where we got sort of we got a little confused about nanotech and then started to stop talking about it. But uh, um, I think that when clarity comes in as to what is and is not considered different forms of the thing we're talking about, people can make better decisions. And then when people worry about something, they worry about the right things. And so I think that's that's the big bit is let's not confuse intel like semi-intelligent toasters with true artificial general intelligence that has thinking capacity equal to or beyond that of a human. And I think those two things are being put together in the mind of many people in the world including people who work in the field, and I, I think we need to decouple them to talk clearly about it and to pay attention to the right things. That's my soapbox. So that's a, not, a, not, a, not a yes, no answer for you, but I don't think that is a yes, no kind of question. Fair enough. Oh, for your artificial limbs, yeah. when you use AI, was it to like, solve or like, figure out how to integrate it, or or like the limbs also thinking on their own? Yeah. You, like the hu you, won't, you want humans not like control of the limb, right? Were you implying that the AI was being used to like figure out how to integrate it, or you meant that the AI was also being used? Yes. Yes to both. Okay. Um, so, <laughs> so the answer is that, yeah, I, I like that I can say the answer is absolutely yes, and then it's like, well, that's more confusing as an answer. Uh, so let me tell you why I said yes to both of those things. Uh, we, there's a, there is a fundamental problem, which is how do, we, how do we directly map exactly what the person wants to how the machine has to move? Uh, that is one of the one of the problems. It's sort of like let's monitor the signals from the body and the and the brain, and how do we then translate that to all of the different actuator commands, say for an artificial limb? There's another piece, which is to acknowledge that even in our biological systems, there's lots of downstream processing. You do like the reflexy thing, and your knee your knee hits. Well, where's that coming from? That doesn't go all the way back up to the brain. 
So the, we, we already have distributed processing throughout our body. When we have injury or illness, sometimes we actually lose the ability to use some of that distributed processing. So we should expect that our assistive technologies, whether they're sort of biological or neuromorphic, whether they look like our body or not, whether it's a wheelchair or a visual limb, we should expect that, yes, they're going to be a conduit for our, our usual intent, but that there might be some forms of autonomy that need to be built in. Autonomous wheelchairs, for instance, like we don't, as a human, really know how to monitor like wheel drive current and things like that. But the system should. Like, there's lots of low-level processing, like even battery management and things like that. Well, uh, that's not something that we were born with. We don't know how to manage batteries, really, in, like in the strict sense. But we hope the system is doing power management. So even at, like that's a level of autonomy that I think we would consider just again down the scale to appliances. That's like engineering, engineering details. As an engineer, I can say that engineering details are hard. Um, but uh, but it is a form of autonomy that, that is sort of abstracted away. And so the the root of your question is where do we draw the abstractions? And I think that we can benefit from thinking at many levels of abstraction in terms of what is being autonomously controlled by the robotic limb and what is a mapping from human intent to that of the, the limb. And I think that depending on how you look at it, you can see any given solution as being both of those things. So in fact, maybe both, it's not that one or the other or one and the other, it's that one is the other, uh, depending on how you look at it. So it's a perspective thing as opposed to a technology thing. Yeah. And then, you, so you work in the Blink lab? Yeah. Also for, so it's like the goal of that lab just to do that, like just make prosthetic arms and do like small projects on the way, of like, like you said, like self love yeah. and that. So we have two really big things that Blink Lab is doing right now. I mean, Blink Lab is, is really like Jackie Heber drives our drives, uh, drives vision. She's our um, director of the Blink Lab and the lead of the adult amputee program at the Glen Road. Jackie's great. And two things I think that she's really passionate about and, and I think are, are our main focuses right now. One is being able to allow people to feel what the prosthetic limb is feeling. So it, like the control loop is actually something, I'm going to say something controversial again, which is that, you know, we've kind of got control figured out. Like people, there's a lot of people who have their eye on the ball in terms of mapping human control signals to the control of robotic limb. Like I'm really happy with that. I think I have lots of really smart colleagues. They're doing amazing work. I've done work on it. Maybe I don't have to keep doing a lot of work on this because People are really, they're thinking about it in the right way, and I think a lot of people all around the world are doing an amazing, amazing job of, of taking signals from the human body and using them to control a robotic arm. I'm still going to, you know, putz around that to me, but it's not my thing. Uh, feedback is something that, that people haven't thought as much about, and it's a, a place where here, especially at the University of Alberta and the Blink Lab, we can make huge gains, I think, in, in thinking about how information is transmitted back from a, an assistive device back to the person to truly close the loop. So this is one of the Jackie's priorities. We brought targeted sensory innovation up here. That was one of her and Ming Chan actually made really big strides in, in like rewiring this, the human nervous system to better receive inputs from the machine that's attached to it. Um, so I think sensation is one thing that the Blink Lab spoke, is focusing on quite a bit. Also kinesthesia and proprioception, uh, not work I'm directly related, like, I'm not directly working on this, but Jackie has some great programs on looking at how you, you might feel where your robotic limb is in space and how it's moving without having to look at it. Like this is something we do with our bodies. How do we get our machine that same sensation back to the machine? So, that, like, so sensation, the great part of closed loop is like yeah, closing the loop, and specifically with lens to feedback. But then the second big thing that we're doing, and we put a ton of effort into it, is measuring it. Actually, it's the most boring thing. You're like, what are you working? I'm like, I'm measuring stuff. Really? I'm like, yeah, it's really like slow and painstaking. We're just going to measure stuff because if we do come up with new interventions, if we do actually embrace some of that new control technology or new bionic limbs. The most important thing isn't that we made a flashy new robot. That's like not actually the point. It's if we were to have this given to someone with an amputation, would they be better able to live their daily life? Would their movements be more natural? Would they be able to use their technology without hurting themselves or causing overcompensation injuries? So a lot of what we're doing now is measurements. So we're motion tracking and eye tracking, building up a whole metrics evaluation suite to better assess the changes that occur when we give, say, someone back the ability to feel by the device or when we let them know where their limb is in space. So, yeah. Those are two big, I mean, we do a lot of stuff, but those are like two, two big thrusts that I think are, I would say, central to what, what we're currently doing in the, in the big lab. Maybe one more question, is that all right? I have to walk over to computer science. So if we, if we wrap at about 3.15, that's probably okay. Um, any more questions, or is everyone okay? Good, good. Okay, thanks, folks. Thanks for the great questions. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Yeah. Um.